Transform Kenya. Empower our nation. The ground has shifted and we are all forced to adapt to the new normal birthed by the coronavirus pandemic. It poses not only a global health crisis, but also an economic paralysis that threatens to grind nations to a halt. Hundreds of jobs have been lost, scores of others lie in the balance. Airlines have been grounded, schools have been closed, with hotels counting losses. Tonight, in our Made in Transform Kenya virtual debate, we talk about possible solutions and the best way forward for Kenyans to navigate through these uncharted waters. I am Abi Agina, your moderator for this virtual Transform Kenya forum. You can join the conversation on our social media platforms on the handles appearing on the screen. Transform Kenya is a standard media group initiative aimed at generating policy discourse that can drive real solutions that will transform our country. Right now, we want to introduce our panelists for this conversation who will be joining us from multiple locations across the country. First off, let me begin by introducing our first guest, and that is Betty Chemutai Miner, the Cabinet Secretary in charge of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development. She has formerly worked as the CEO for the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and also she's a former Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Environment. Our second guest is Dr. David Ndi, the Managing Director of Africa Economics. David Ndi is the Managing Director and he has served as a technical advisor on public finance to the Committee of Experts. He's also an avid reader and a columnist. We also expect to host Honorable Moses Kuria, the Member of Parliament for Gatondo South. He was also the is a member of the budget committee in the National Assembly and is also formerly a banker who has vast experience in business re-engineering and is also an accountant. Well, our next guest will be joining us from Siokimao, and that is Victor Otieno, who is the Chief Executive Officer for VIFA Consult. Victor is the Managing Director of VIFA Consult, a consulting outfit that offers SMEs research and data analytics capabilities that drives unmatched and sustained competitive advantage. He holds an MBA in entrepreneurship and is also a CPAK holder. Empower our nation. Welcome one more time to our discussion tonight. We shall be exploring the breadth and depth of the coronavirus. How has it impacted on Kenya's economy? We'll also be looking at solutions towards this. And of course, as I did mention, we have a power panel tonight who will be joining us to just give us their perspectives and what is the way forward. But remember, in case you're at home, you can join us through our live audience platform which will be sc scrolling at the bottom of your screen, and that is slido.com. Remember, in case you need to share your questions, the enter code that you need to put in is Transform Kenya. And you can also catch us on Twitter using our Twitter handles at KTNewsKE. And remember, our hashtag tonight is Transform Kenya SG. We want to open up this discussion right now by, of course, getting some perspectives from our panelists. And uh, my first question to all of us is, this is the new normal, Kenyans working from home, and of course, companies have made it possible for employees to work from home. And there's also the curfew that people will have to go home latest by 6 p.m. in order to get home by 7. I just want to know, how has the coronavirus affected your lives in terms of this reorganization we are seeing across the board. We start off with C.S. Beatty. Uh, thank you very much, Abby, and thank you for putting this uh, talk together. And I guess a sign of the times is the fact that uh, we are doing this virtually rather than in the studio, which I think is the new, the new way of working. 
and actually quite efficient. I think we all have spent a lot of time just trying to get ready uh, at the studio. We had all come round. Now, I think uh, the reason why we're doing this is because these are necessary measures for us to be able to control transmission and to flatten the curve. If we had continued uh, with life as we did, uh, mingling in, in many different places, then we would be able to transmit this faster and it would overwhelm the healthcare system. But thanks to these measures, uh, we now um, you know, only have a bit over 230 cases in Kenya, having tested 10,000 people. And I think you know, if we continue to keep at this, um, over the next period of time, we'll be able to flatten the curve and be able to resume some form of normalcy, but hopefully some of the good habits we have picked up during this period will stay with us. And also, I want to just get your thoughts, Dr. Ndi. How has this impacted on basically your way of life, knowing that uh, a lot has been happening around? Let me start by saying hello to, 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 to my friend Betty. What you, you couldn't say and you don't know is that Betty and I are former CEOs of the Institute of Economic Affairs. I was the founding CEO in 1993, and Betty was, I think, number three or four from around 1996. So it's quite fun for me to be on this panel with her. As to how it has affected me personally, to be honest, I, I feel a bit guilty and, and privileged to say that uh, not very much because I work from home as a as an independent consultant and, uh, and mostly a writer, the best place for me to, to work is where at home. Those who can see me can see I'm actually sitting in my library. But I do sort of, uh, I'm very alive to, to the fact that, uh, that many people are not able to do this. And I, and I noted, for instance, that you said that Kenyans are having to get used to uh, working from home. And I said I was going to make a point of correcting you and tell you that office workers have the luxury of working from home. But the vast majority of uh, Kenyans uh, are in the physical economy and they, do, they cannot work from home. And I'm a bit disturbed by the fact that uh, the office workers, the elite, who are also the, the decision makers, may not be as alive to that fact as, as they ought to be. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Let me also get uh, perspectives from uh, Victor Tieno, live from Siokimao. Um, thank you very much, Abby, for, for having me. Um, I think for starters, uh, I, I, would, I would like one at least to start with agreeing with the uh, Dr. there in terms of uh, the narrative that uh, at least most of us are trying to push that, uh, you know, the Kenyan, uh, the, the Kenyan worker is working from home. Uh, just to give us a baseline, uh, we know that 79% of um, the 7.5 million SMEs in Kenya are in the informal sector. And I think that's, that's where we need to start this conversation from. All right. We're also expecting Moses Kuria, Member of Parliament for Gatun, will be joining us shortly. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick start this discussion tonight. Well, many have questioned the level with which the government interventions have come with, from the curfew and, of course, matters to do with how the government has been, uh, of course, handling matters related to the lockdowns that we have seen, the partial lockdown of the economy, where we are not having any flights coming into the country, the passenger flights. And of course, this has impacted on travel, tourism, and to name but a few. CS Minor, what is your assessment so far in terms of the government interventions? Have we been too extreme or have we been a bit lenient? No, I think we have done everything according to the advice of dealing with such a pandemic. Huh? 
first it, it 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 you know it originated outside kenya and it is carried by human beings so it was important to actually start to address uh, the issue of travel and, and restrictions on travel secondly uh, we have uh, undertaken and that's why we saw things like mandatory quarantine to ensure that we could confine any potential carriers to one place so that they don't spread it to others the second thing that we've done is also restrict activities that enable people to mingle and therefore some of the you know the measures around ensuring that in markets for instance there is sufficient distance between uh, operators there is sufficient distance between our uh, buyers and and you know beginning to even reduce the use of uh, cash that has been part of the measures taken and i think they have worked very well in a, in our country i think the countries that took a while to enforce these social distancing measures have had a much greater rise of transmission which has overwhelmed their public health systems interesting uh, inputs there cs uh, i now understand we have moses kuria member of parliament for gatundu south he's with us and if you can hear me, Honorable Kuria, we are, of course, beginning our discussion with uh, assessing the magnitude with which the government interventions, have they been effective from your assessment? Well, I think uh, Kenyans are very dynamic people. And the fact that uh, a lot of people have managed to adapt to very, you know, very novel uh, situations is quite commendable, and that speaks volumes about the Kenyan spirit. Um, as to the government interventions, I am, I'm quite pleased with some of them. Uh, but others make me wonder um, whether we really needed COVID to be able to do some of the things that we're able to do now. So in some ways, uh, COVID is a disaster, is a bad thing, is something that we will not wish upon ourselves. But it also has been a wake-up call uh, in terms of doing some of the things that some of us have been have been screaming about, I'm, I'm very pleased with the CS Betty Miner and uh, the fact that he has gotten manufacturers, local manufacturers, to wake up and start responding to this situation. And uh, for now, I am, I am, I'm, I'm, it's all accurate for her. But after all this is done, we're gonna have some time to ask Betty Miner and government. Why were we not doing this before? All right, All right thank, thank you, Moses. Moses. And uh, let me throw it off to Dr. Devin D. Your overall assessment on how we've responded so far. Let me, let me preface that by saying, by making three conceptual points. One, corona, I want to disabuse people of the hope that coronavirus is a passing cloud. It is not a passing cloud. Asia is now experiencing a second wave. It started with Singapore, which has gone into a semi-lockdown. Japan also has gone into lo another lockdown of sorts. China is not telling everything, but it also has an upsurge. The best case scenario for this in terms of economic impact is 18 months, starting from January to June next year. And the impact will be huge. Point number two, the economic impact and the economic dynamics of this virus is now a behavioral phenomena. It is not dependent on the, uh, on the disease. It's not epidemiological. Uh, the self-preservation instinct is, is the most powerful impulse in a living thing. And we have no precedent of seeing how people will balance out the fear of infection and the impetus to want to go back to their normal lives. I have seen an estimate saying that the airline industry, minimum, it will be grounded for three years. It may be three years before you get back to normal. Point number three is that money is not the problem. 
The problem is that is, is how to spend it. People cannot spend money because they are sheltering in place. Yeah? Now, these people talking about stimulating the economy and QE and all sorts of things, even in advanced economies like America, they are actually trying to navigate new terrain with an old map. They are going to end up with huge monetary overhang at the end of this, and that is going to be quite whatever. Let me come back to uh, how we are responding, because I actually don't think we have understood those three things I have said. My own, I did a quick estimate, which is in an op-ed I published today in the Elephant. And one of the things All I right, estimate Daxari, is that are, by the end a challenge. of this month... Daxari, experiencing a challenge with your feed. But let's uh, put this uh, matter, of course, also to Victor. We'll be coming back to you, Daktari. Victor, how has been the response mechanism so far? How would you rate it? Um, I think, uh, I think from, from, a, from a novice point of view, in terms of uh, you know, uh, be, not being part of the medical fraternity, I think based on the, uh, on, on the data that we've been seeing and the kind of measures that have been put forward, I think they are commendable in the sense that uh, we are not seeing the levels of, of spread of the virus uh, as compared to other, other places uh, such as Spain um, you know, and Italy and the rest of the world. So I think from my own assessment is that uh, we are moderately, moderately doing, doing well. All right. And, uh, my, my only concern would be around... Uh, All right, Victor, we'll be coming back to you shortly. And uh, Dr. Ndi, you've made some serious comment there around uh, money is not the problem, yet many Kenyans are struggling to actually make ends meet. CS, what is your reaction to this, especially now that uh, we've seen a number of uh, interventions around st uh, the economic stimulus package that the government has been pushing forward from the tax reliefs, matters to do with uh, empowering SMEs, and yet the money seems not to be trickling down. I, my, my take is, I estimate that from end of this month, a quarter of Nairobi's population, the Nairobi metropolitan area, will not have a penny in their pocket. That's about 1.5 million uh, people. Just food and soap alone is 75 million a day. So you need to see, and that's just Nairobi, which is where the, the most vulnerable population is. And I think um, my number of 25% 20, 25 is actually conservative, because businesses which are shutting down may have paid people for one month, but they will run out of that money. The second thing is that, as I said, money is not the problem. But the nature of this crisis is that the market economy cannot function properly. Market economy depends on physical interaction and mobility. So the shelves are already running empty. The businesses that are closing may not be able to open. The farmers that we are losing money because their produce is not getting the market, they will not have the working capital to plant enough crops to feed the country. So we are talking about what in economics a supply shock. There will not be enough goods to buy, to go around. Yeah? So people who are talking about money are thinking demand management, that if you put money in people's pockets, they will be able to provide for themselves. You need to do both. You need to provide the people who are losing, to replace the incomes, people who are losing money, and you need to go to the supply side and ensure that essential goods and services are not uh, 
too severely disrupted. All right. At the very beginning of this thing, I said we need to start thinking about wartime economic management, which is managing supply lines. And I am not sure that uh, sort of message has percolated. Okay, Dr. Ari. CS, what would be your rejoinder to this? CS, CS, if you can hear me, uh, valid points being raised there by Dr. Ndi. What, what is your immediate reaction to this? All right, we'll be getting back to the CS. Uh, Honorable Kuria, very pertinent issues being raised there by Dr. Ndi that uh, there is money, but how to spend it is what matters right now. Of course, uh, what is your reaction to this as well? Let me start by uh, the first point, which is, I think is more fundamental point from Dr. Ndi, about uh, his projections about when we can expect this situation to persist. And he, he reckons that this is an 18 month situation from, uh, from, from January to mid next year. Uh, it's good to err on the side of caution. Uh, and Dr. D is an economist, so his business is numbers and projections. But I think without empirical modeling, uh, that's, that's quite some scary statements to make. I would, I, I would want to think that, uh, that that needs to be subjected to some, to some serious scrutiny and analysis. Uh, I, from my own uh, uh, analysis, going by the growth of the numbers that have been reported so far, I would call it a plateau in our situation. And I would really, you know, wish to be proven wrong. Because over the last two weeks, uh, we've not gone beyond nine cases. And I'm not saying that people should, we should relax on this situation. I'm just saying that um, uh, even in the United States of America, the figures that were projecting by their modeling has been proven to be grossly overstated. So for an economy that can hardly sustain uh, the kind of um, an overrun on our systems as ours, I think we need to be more empirical, more scientific in terms of the numbers that we work with. In terms of um, uh, supply shock uh, versus demand management, uh, I think what we have uh, is, and maybe, maybe Dr. D may not know, uh, but for us who interact with the Monainty every day, I think we are nearing a rebellion, a rebellious economy, whereby more in some of the, uh, towards the bottom of the pyramid, the business activities, the trading activities, yes, they may be affected, but there is some sort of normalcy in terms of some of the trading, which then uh, shows that uh, the consumption may not be affected as much. So I, I would vote for the demand side of this equation. I would vote for having more money into people's pockets. I think Kenyans are versatile. If you put money into their pockets, somehow, somehow, they have got a way of surviving. And Dr. D raises a very fundamental point in terms of and that's where the worry is, uh, the salaried people, the elites, the people who work in offices, who are paid a salary maybe towards the end of March, and by the next salary, uh, you know, it may be uh, dried up. Um, we are going to have from Parliament uh, engagements over the next one week All right. with, the, with the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury, mm -hmm. uh, CS Ukuri Atani, and I'm going to be engaging him uh, in terms of... Uh, interrogating whether we can be able to uh, split the payroll for the public sector into weekly payments so that we keep the economy running all the time. I think if you pay public sector every week and hope that even the private sector will catch the queue, then we somehow can manage the demand management and then uh, by our people's versatility coupled with government intervention, we can keep the supply side going. Of course, all this is going to be hampered by uh, the import side, 
which if you look at the supply shock, it is not even more of the local situation. I think the government has been good enough to allow movement of essential goods like foods, ETC, even within the lockdown areas. But the big problem is uh, even on uh, sectors like manufacturing, which are depending on imported goods, that will take a shock. So I think um, we need to have a balance of both the demand side and the supply side. All right, Moses. Uh, and uh, Victor, how practical are these uh, interventions that uh, uh, Moses Honorable Kuria is raising on the table? And uh, if you could also respond to the earlier comment by Dr. Ndi around uh, this matter being persistent till next year, how will it impact on SMEs? You do a lot of work with SMEs. How will it impact them? Um, I think maybe to just set a baseline, um, looking at um, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics um, economic, um, I think SME report 2016, uh, they estimated that by then there were around 7 point something, 7.7 .7 million um, SMEs in Kenya, with 79% of these SMEs being um, un unlicensed and informal. So the question that uh, I have uh, is the inter interventions or the stimulus package that, uh, that were proposed by the president on issues around uh, turnover tax, uh, corporate tax, and reduction on, on VAT. I question the, the, um, the veracity of this uh, kind of intervention reaching to the 79% 70, informal businesses. So I think uh, moving forward, um, as I think uh, Honorable Kuri has mentioned, there, there is need for us to really put money in the pocket of uh, these SMEs in the informal sector. And um, I think maybe a direct cash transfer, either a mixture of grant and soft loan, is something that most probably we need to look into. All right, Victor. We have the CS back online. And uh, CS BT, a lot has transpired. And uh, the common theme across is that uh, putting money in the pockets of Kenyans. Of course, uh, you've been running this initiative around promoting the local manufacturing by one of the key cases is the manufacture of masks locally. At the same time, this is just one area that will benefit. How about the other sectors? We have uh, people who are exporting products. We have people who are importing products. And yet, we are not clear on how we structure how they will be operating in this uh, model where you cannot really ship goods in some of the countries. At the same time, we are trying to keep businesses afloat. Look, um, thank you, sorry, we got cut off. I, I think the big issue there is uh, twofold. Huh? <laughs> sorry, there's a lot of feedback. I don't know if I can help it. I'll, I'll try and I'll, I'll try and do that. I think the, in order to manage the spread of COVID, all right, CS, we'll be getting back to you shortly. But uh, Honorable Kuria, you've uh, actually let me take it to Dr. D. Dr. D, you've been uh, challenged on the viability of uh, some of the claims that you have made in terms of how long this might persist. Do you have any evidence? Actually, yes, a lot. Let me explain to you. The, the horticulture industry has shut down. We do not know when Europeans will buy flowers again because the Holland auction is not working. There are 30,000 low-income flower workers in Naivisha. That, that, that economy, okay, so what will those people eat? How long will horticulture be down? The businesses which have lost their flower crops, will they be able to recover from uh, a, a, whole, a whole year's uh, loss, uh, loss of income? Airlines are grounded. We do not know many... I just, Serena closed 10, I think 10 lodges. Uh, when will tourism be back up? Kenya Airways is grounded, the international flights. When will those be back up? That does not depend on us. It depends on the global dynamics. 
of the, uh, of, of the economic dynamics of the pandemic. So, and I have estimated how much are we losing in terms of uh, expenditure in the domestic economy from the disruption of the economy? My estimate is about 400 billion shillings a month. If you add up that only to July, and then a slow recovery to the end of the year, it is a contraction of 2 trillion shillings. That's not uh, going around in the economy. And that will mean that this year we are looking at a GDP growth contraction of to 3%, minus 3% growth from 5%. We have no precedent of such a shock. Even the uh, 07 was not like that. The, 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 the 1984 drought was not like that. The 82 coup shock was not like that. The 73 oil shock was not that big. And that is only if this normalcy begins to return to the global economy in July. And since we are seeing a second wave, in uh, Japan, in, in Asia, and by the time the U.S., even if it's beginning to level off, by the time the U.S. curve sort of, it works itself through the U.S. from the East Coast to the West Coast, we are really talking August, uh, August, August, September, best case scenario. So when I'm talking about 18 months for the global economy, it's actually the best case scenario for the global economy. Which, of course, has a trickle down to our local economy. In fact, to us. Yeah. And the region. Because what's happening, if, as some epidemiologists are, are, are suggesting, that this thing is also temperature driven, it might then shift to the southern hemisphere during the southern hemisphere winter and then come back to the northern hemisphere in the winter like the 1918 Spanish influenza, those scenarios are out there. And that is what I'm saying. We are not, we don't seem to be, to be paying attention to those scenarios. I am paying attention to a lot of that. This is what I do for a living. I do macro risk management uh, analysis. Oh, wow. um, so I am I'm sort of scanning the entire globe and asking what are the economic dynamics that are emerging and how do they affect us, how do they affect uh, the, the, the region and that kind of thing. Okay. So that is my, my sort of ex expert opinion based on my synthesis of all the data that I'm observing. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harry. That if you're managing a big business or the economy, you need to be thinking 18 months. Okay. If you want to wish for thinking, yes, you can wish it away, but that's what the numbers are saying. All right. I can see Moses Kuria itching to respond, as well as uh, my other panelists. We want to take a quick commercial break. Don't go too far. We're still having this discussion. Remember, our hashtag is Transform Kenya SG, and we'll be back after a short commercial break. Transform Kenya. Transform Kenya.